We live in an age of emerging infectious disease. We humans are getting attacked by an increasing number of brand new infectious diseases. Where's the next disease likely to break out? Why? What are we doing to the environment that might make a disease more likely to emerge? To answer those questions, you need to understand what are the complex interactions between species in nature that give rise to these emergence events. Lyme disease was discovered when um, a very unusual cluster of cases of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis occurred in and around Lyme, Connecticut. And it took some serious detective work to figure out that this arthritis was a late stage symptom of a disease caused by a bacterium that's transmitted to people by tick bites. And since the late 70s and early 80s, Lyme disease has grown dramatically, both in number of cases and in the spatial extent of the disease itself. And right now, throughout the North Temperate Zone, Lyme disease is the most commonly reported vector-borne disease. Vectors are insects or ticks that transmit pathogens from one host to another. The ticks that transmit Lyme disease to people hatch free of infection. They only take one blood meal. Then they molt into the nymphal stage. If that host that they fed on was infected, they can acquire the Lyme bacteria and they can then transmit Lyme disease. But all hosts are certainly not created equal in terms of disease risks that affect humans. We're interested in how the diversity of the host population affects the likelihood that ticks are going to be infected with Lyme. So that translates into risk to humans. This is an animal that Kira caught three or four days ago, and it's been sitting in the rearing facility eating wonderful food <laughs> and dropping ticks. This had, I think, quite a few ticks, didn't oh, it? Oh yeah, oh yeah, lots of ticks. If we can lift it, they, it makes them really... So we need to know how likely each species is to feed ticks, how many ticks it feeds, how likely it is to infect the ticks that it feeds. And then we can sort of deconstruct the host community and see what would equal high risk to people and what would equal low risk to people. So we've tried to capture everything with fur and feathers, essentially. We got something in this one. On most days, we get up in the morning and we go out and we check traps that have been set the night before. So this is a female lactating? Then any animals that we caught are processed. Some of them are very good at transmitting the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. And some are what we would consider dilution hosts. Yep, little mouse. Animals that may feed a lot of ticks, but don't transmit the bacteria. Nice. Yep. Possums. Possums tend to feed a lot of ticks, you know, so they'll get a lot of ticks on them. Not many of those ticks will actually make it off, so a lot of them die somewhere in that process. Um, and then of those that actually make it through to the next stage, most of them aren't infected, so they tend to be pretty good uh, dilution hosts. So a lot of possums in the environment is actually pretty good for lowering our risk of Lyme disease. So we like these little guys. <laughs> He's going to play dead. <laughs> Bye, guy. We determine which host is the best for spreading Lyme disease by bringing them back to the lab. We hold them for about three days. And during those three days, any larvae that are naturally infesting the animal will feed and drop off. So we collect the, the ticks in here after they drop off. So this is our data. We search the pan and collect the ticks that have engorged, which gives us a couple of pieces of information. We can figure out how many ticks are feeding on that animal at any given moment. And we can eventually test the tick to determine the percentage of ticks that end up being infected.
Right now I'm taking ticks to crush, and that's how we get the gut material out of the tick, and then isolate the DNA. Then we run it through a real-time PCR, or polymerase chain reaction, which is the way of splitting the DNA and detecting Lyme disease. What we found is that the probability that a tick is going to acquire an infection when it feeds on a white-footed mouse is about 90%. Contrast that with the probability that it's going to get infected if it feeds off an opossum or a skunk or raccoon, which they readily bite, and that's down below 10%. As we fragment the landscape, we chop up continuous forest into little bits. We lose species. They disappear. One of the last creatures is the white-footed mouse. So as we reduce diversity, we're losing the species that protect us and favoring the ones that make us sick. There's no such thing as a natural system anymore, a truly natural system. As you start reducing forest sizes, you start making habitats that the really resilient species can tolerate and some of the other species can't. So what we're studying obviously isn't natural systems. It's human impacted natural systems. And what we're becoming more aware of is that human impacts can bite us back. <laughs>